Well, brothers and sisters, it, it truly is a privilege to speak at this conference. Kevin, thank you so much for the kind invitation. I've been asked to speak on a gospel narrative, and we're looking at John's gospel in chapter 6, where John records the story of the feeding of the 5,000, and then tells us what happened the following day. I'd like to read from the end of the chapter, from verse 60 through to verse 69, so let us hear the Word of God. When many of His disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in Himself that His disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where He was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray Him. And He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to Me unless it is granted Him by the Father. After this, many of His disciples turned back and no longer walked with Him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered Him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Word of God. Now, we're looking this evening at a very hard day in the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. A day when vast numbers of people uh, who at one time showed great interest in Jesus simply walked away and abandoned Him. This chapter that we're looking at, as you know well, begins with an unveiling of Jesus' glory as He multiplied the loaves and the fish. And at the end, as we've read, John tells us that after this, many of His disciples turned back and no longer walked with Him. Now, I've chosen this story to speak on this evening because it speaks very obviously and very directly to the challenges that we face in ministry today. How do you sustain gospel ministry at a time when many people are moving away from faith? And it seems to me that the promise in the middle of this chapter in verse 37 uh, is of wonderful help to us, especially in this regard. These wonderful words of Jesus that C.H. Spurgeon called the sum and substance of all theology, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So, what I want us to do in this time in John chapter 6 together this evening is to begin with the promise in verse 37, then to tell the story, and then to apply the promise in the light of the story with the prayer that God will use this to help to sustain us in gospel ministry. So, first then, the promise, verse 37 all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, Jesus says, I will never cast out. Now, one of the joys of watching football uh, 
by which you understand I mean soccer. Um, one of the joys of watching on television is that you see more than you would see if you were actually at the game. The replays show you what was happening from various points of view so that you get a, a fuller picture of what, as you would say, is the play. You see the play, you then see it from a uh, reverse angle, you then see it from the touchline, and so forth and so on. Well, this verse very obviously gives us three wonderful camera angles, as it were, on the one great event of our salvation. One camera, as it were, is trained uh, on the activity of God the Father. All that the Father gives me, Jesus says. And then the second camera is trained on the sinner coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever comes to me. And the third camera is focused on the Lord Jesus Christ keeping the sinner, I will never cast out. The, the Father gives, the sinner comes, the Savior keeps, the great movements of our salvation. The Father gives certain people to the Son, and Jesus speaks about this repeatedly, especially in John in chapter 17 verse 6 of John 17, I have manifested your name, he says to the Father, to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Verse 6 again, yours they were, and you gave them to me. Verse 9 of chapter 17, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those who you have given me, for they are yours. Now, who are these people who the Father has given to His Son. How do we know who they are? The answer is that they are the ones who come to Him. They come because they are given. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And how do they come? Well, Jesus speaks so wonderfully in this chapter about that. Verse 44, they come because they're drawn by the Father. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. They, they come because they are taught by the Father. Verse 45, it's written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And then as we just ponder this wonderful promise and try and take it into our souls, how many of those who are given to Christ actually come to Christ? Well, of course, we get used to working with percentages. How many contacts turn into sales? How many students actually graduate? understand that the airlines overbook flights because they simply assume that a certain percentage of people won't actually make it to the airport. But how many of the people the Father has given to the Son actually come to Him? The answer is all of them, 100%. All that the Father gives me will come to me. So the Father gives and the sinner comes whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus invites all people to come to him. Whoever comes to me, you can't get more inclusive than that. And so this wonderful truth that the Father gives certain people to the Son never excludes any person who wants to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We brothers have the great privilege of seeing to any and every person without inhibition and without exception, if you will come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and in repentance, he will welcome you, he uh, invites you, he, he offers himself to you. Christ will be yours if you will have him. You can say that to any person. And of course, people will come to Christ when they see something compelling in him. John Bunyan points out in commenting on this verse, what Abraham found in Christ made him ready to leave home and go to another country. What Moses found in him 
made him glad to give up the comfort of a palace in Egypt and suffer with the people of God. What Daniel found in him was enough for him to live with integrity in a godless world, even when that meant being thrown in a lion's den. And that, of course, is why exalting the Lord Jesus Christ must always be central in all of our preaching. What is there, I have to ask myself in the process of preparation, what is there in this sermon that would draw a person to Jesus Christ? What, a, what have I said that will exalt him, that will commend him to other people? What am I saying about the Lord Jesus Christ from this scripture that would cause a person to feel he is worth living for and he is worth dying for? The Father gives, the sinner comes, and the Son keeps. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Those who come to Christ are the Father's gift to him. The Father gives them, the Son keeps them. And so the book of Hebrews describes that wonderful scene on the last day when the Son of God himself will stand in the presence of the Father and he will say, here I am and the children you have given to me. And he's not going to be saying, I've got most of them, certainly not, I've got some of them, I've got all of them, not one of them will be missing. And uh, Jesus himself makes this so clear in these very verses in John 6. Look at verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it up on the last day. So here is a precious, soul-nourishing promise for us to take to heart. All that the Father gives me, Jesus says, will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That's the promise. Now to the story. And here I want us to observe four things. First, the miracle, then the reaction, then the teaching of Jesus, and then the offense that was taken. First, the miracle, verse 5. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus sees this large crowd coming toward him. John tells us in verse 10, 5,000 men. I think we can reasonably assume that there would have been a similar number of women. And if you throw in a couple of children for each of these, then uh, perhaps this crowd could have been as large as 20,000 people. It was a very, very large crowd indeed. And Jesus turns to Philip, seeing this crowd, and asks this question, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And notice that John tells us in verse 6 that Jesus knew what he would do. He knew that he was going to reveal his glory by feeding this multitude. So since Jesus knew what he was going to do, why is he asking Philip this question? Well, John tells us very clearly here, he said this to test him. So here, friends, we get an inside look at one of the ways that Jesus tests the faith of his disciples. He tests our faith by giving us tasks that are clearly beyond our own ability. And when Philip is faced with this question, he immediately responds 
by calculating the need. He, you can almost see him going into a calculation kind of mode. He says in verse 7, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. And as you know well, a denarius was about a day's wage, 200 denarii then the best part of a year's wages. Who has a year's wages to spend on a single meal? So, Philip is facing a challenge that he knows is way beyond him. And some of us have come here to this conference, I'm sure, feeling precisely the same. The needs that are around me, the demands that are upon me, are such that I don't know if I have what it takes. Now, while Philip calculates the need... Andrew assesses the resources. Perhaps he was seeking to begin on a more optimistic note. Now, let's, let's approach this from the perspective of what we have. And uh, he does his research, and what he comes back with isn't much. Uh, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many. So Philip says, well, the need's overwhelming. Andrew says, well, the resources are pitiful. <laughs> this is a story for all the times when the need around you is great and the resources available are limited and your faith is tested. And perhaps, indeed, you are facing right now a sense of a challenge that you know is beyond you. You think, I don't have the strength for this. I, I don't have the patience. I don't have the stamina. I do not have what it takes. That's where these disciples were at this point. And isn't the good news, what we read in verse 6, that Jesus already knows what he will do? And notice how he moves the disciples forward. Jesus said, have the people sit down, verse 10. Now, it would have been surely an act of faith for the disciples to obey this command of Jesus. Remember, Jesus knew what he was going to do. The disciples certainly didn't. And Mark gives us the extra detail that the crowd was to be seated in groups of 50 or 100. And, of course, uh, that kind of organization would immediately create some expectations, and expectations have the potential to be embarrassing. Now, I'm British, and if I'd been asked to do this, I suspect that I would have tried to do it very politely. Um, Excuse me, um, Jesus has asked that we sit down in, in groups of 50 or 100. If you could just form a, a group here, that would be really helpful. To which someone says, why? What's happening? Uh, well, I, 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 I don't know really. <laughs> um, but Jesus has told us to get you all seated. Could you just help with that? The obedience of the disciples in seating the crowd in groups of 50 and 100 was surely an act of faith. And the disciples surely give us a good example here. Obey Jesus Christ even when you don't know what he's doing. And then John tells us, verse 11, that Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. A miracle took place in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Food that had not existed before was created, and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ was revealed 
as he did what God alone could do. Two observations just at this point in the story. One is that Jesus is able to do more than we think. Isn't that good news? Um, it's quite clear from Philip's calculation and from Andrew's research that the miracle that took place here was a complete surprise to the disciples. None of them expected it at all. The Apostle Paul says that he is able to do far more abundantly above all that we ask and all that we think. The Lord Jesus Christ is able to do more than any person in this beautiful sanctuary tonight thinks he can. What we see is the overwhelming need. What we see is the limits in the resources. A.W. Pink says, thank God his blessings are dispensed according to the riches of his grace and not according to the poverty of our faith. Now, there is, of course, a principle in Scripture that according to your faith be it unto you, but thank God he is not limited to the range of our faith. Um, when you see that Christ is able to do more than you think, your faith will grow. Think about this. If the Lord Jesus Christ was restricted to the range of my faith, what that means is he can't do very much. And if he can't do very much, then my reason for trusting him just got less. That's a downward spiral. It is faith diminishing. But if Christ is able to do more than I think all things are possible for him, and inasmuch as we see that Christ is not limited even by the range of our faith, that actually is a reason for faith to increase. Jesus is able to do more than we think. And then this other observation that has pressed itself into my mind and heart, Jesus will give you all that you need for all that he's calling you to do. Now, John tells us in verse 11 here that Jesus distributed the food, of course, because the miracle took place in his hands. But Mark adds the detail that the way that Jesus distributed the food was through the disciples. Mark 6 and verse 41, he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. Now, probably like Philip, I got my calculator out at this point. 5,000 men, 12 disciples. Each disciple serving 416 men. That's a lot of dinners to serve. And if we add a woman and two children for each of the men, if the crowd was getting towards 20,000 people, that's 1,600 people for each disciple to serve. Now, obvious question. How much bread and fish can a man carry in his arms at one time? Well, you see then what happened. You receive bread and fish from the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you go to your group of 50 or 100 people, and you give them what you have received from his hands. And then you come back to Jesus again, and he gives you more. And then you take what you receive from him back to your people. On and on it goes, receiving from Jesus, giving to the people that which you have received. The, these disciples were like runners for Jesus. Isn't that the most beautiful, beautiful picture of ministry, receiving from the hand of Christ in order to give to the people he has entrusted to you, going back to Christ to receive more, and going to the people in order to give more. Jesus will give you all that you need for all that he is calling you to do. Now, let's follow the story. That's the miracle. What was the response? Verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. 
and perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force and to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, as soon as the crowd see what Jesus is able to do, notice the response, they want to use him to fulfill their agenda. And their agenda was quite simple and clearly well established. They wanted to get rid of Roman rule. And they figured out very quickly that if they can tie Jesus to their cause, they will be successful. But notice here very clearly, Jesus will not be captive to any agenda or to any demand. He slips away from them. He withdraws to the mountain by himself. Those who try to use him, lose him. And then that evening, as we follow the story, verse 16, the disciples get into the boat and they go across the lake. And Jesus very wonderfully came to them walking on the water. He got into the boat and then immediately the disciples were brought safely to the other side. And John records that the next day, the crowd went back to the place where they had been fed. They're looking for Jesus. They can't find him. And so they decide that the best hope that they have is to go after the disciples who'd gone to the other side of the lake. So they get into this little flotilla of boats and they go over to Capernaum. And in verse 25, they find Jesus and Jesus begins to teach them. So we've looked at the miracle. We've looked at the response. Let's look at the teaching. Jesus speaks to them primarily about three things. First, he speaks to them about eternal life. Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life that the Son of Man will give you. Or verse 40, this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Or verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. He's performed this amazing miracle, but now the next day he says, I need to speak to you about eternal life. And then he speaks to them about himself. I am the bread of life. States it twice, verse 35 and verse 48. Verse 57, whoever feeds on me will live because of me. Or verse 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus speaks about eternal life again and again and again. He speaks of himself again and again and again. And he speaks to them about faith. Verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Uh, or verse uh, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Or verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then notice what follows in verse 36. But you have seen me and yet you do not believe. So Jesus speaks about eternal life. He speaks about himself. He speaks about faith. And here are people who evidently, despite having come from the other side of the lake, have no interest in eternal life, no interest in Jesus himself, and no interest in faith. And then we've looked at the miracle, the response, the teaching. Now I want us to look at the offense. We saw in verse 60 that we read earlier, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back 
and no longer walked with him. The crowd takes offense at Jesus for three reasons that John indicates in verse 40, verse 60, and in verse 66. Um, The first of these is the uniqueness of the incarnation. Look at verse 41. The Jews grumbled about him. Why? Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And here's their complaint in verse 42. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus speaks about how he came down from heaven again and again and again in these words in John and chapter 6. Look at it in verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 50, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that uh, one, uh, one may eat of it and not die. And verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And John tells us, verse 41, that the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Friends, these folks would have welcomed a Jesus, sim- welcomed Jesus simply as a moral example or as a social reformer, but they grumbled because he said, I came down from heaven. Came down from heaven puts him in a different category from anyone else who has ever lived, and that gives him a unique claim over every life. They couldn't stand it. It was offensive to them, the uniqueness of the incarnation. And then they were offended by the necessity of the atonement. Jesus speaking again and again about his flesh and about his blood. Notice verse 33. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And in verse 51, he makes clear that he gives life to the world by giving his life for the world. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And Jesus refers repeatedly to his own flesh and blood, especially from verse 53 onwards. And verse 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Verse 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Verse 55, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Verse 56, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. The flesh and blood of Jesus clearly referring to the sacrifice that Jesus offered when he stood in our place and died for our sins on the cross. And John then records verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it. The necessity of the atonement, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? The uniqueness of the incarnation, the necessity of the atonement, and our dependence on grace. Jesus said, verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Our culture proudly proclaims that we're all able and therefore we can all be our own savior, that we're all good and therefore we do not need an atonement, that we all have our own truth, that it lives within us and therefore the great quest of life is one of self-discovery and we do not need to be taught or drawn by God. The uniqueness of the incarnation, the necessity of the atonement, our dependence upon grace, offensive in the time of Jesus, and still, as all of us know here, very offensive today. And so this vast crowd that at one time had shown such interest in Jesus, 
had even experienced a miracle, had even crossed a lake in order to find him, take offense against him, and they turn away. And if you preach the uniqueness of the incarnation and the necessity of the atonement and our dependence upon grace, many will turn away from you as well. Now, this story then, it seems to me, speaks very clearly to the realities of ministry that each and every one of us faces today. You extend yourself in ministry, and what you find when you speak about eternal life and about Jesus and about faith, you find that many are disinterested in these things. And then you find that there are others who want to impose their agenda on Jesus, and they want to impose their agenda on you. And when you won't change your message, and you won't buy their agenda, they leave. They leave. And I found it helpful to see from John chapter 6 that Jesus has been there. Verse 36 you have seen me. I mean, they actually saw him. And still you do not believe. So where do we go from there? Where do you go from verse 36? You go to verse 37. <laughs> All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. In Acts 18, Luke records what happened when Paul went to Corinth, the Las Vegas of the early world. Really, really tough place for gospel ministry. And Luke records how Paul gave himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was, is the Christ. But he says that they opposed Paul and reviled him. That's a strong word. Reviled him. Where do you go from there? Well, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a dream. Do not be afraid but go on speaking and do not be silent. And here's why. I am with you and I have many in this city who are my people. And you say, well, how does Jesus have many people in Corinth at a time when there were just a handful of believers? Uh, you see what the Lord is saying. They're mine. They're mine because the Father has given them to, to me. I, I, they don't know this yet. But, but the Father has given them to me. They're in this city and they will come. And does that then mean that we just sit back and let God do the work? No. The risen Lord says to Paul, do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Don't you be silent. Keep speaking. Keep proclaiming the gospel. Why? Because Jesus has many people in this city and they will come through the proclamation of the gospel. Friends, there will be times when the need around you seems absolutely overwhelming. There will be times when the resources seem pitifully small. There will be times when you just don't know what Jesus is doing. Obey Jesus anyway. Do what he has called you to do. And there will be times when people show little interest in faith, in Jesus, eternal life. You might even feel some pressure to change the focus. There will be times 
when the message that you bring will cause offense. Hold fast to the gospel anyway. And do this with confidence, believing the promise of Jesus. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Let's pray together. Father, we ask very simply that you will sustain each of us in gospel ministry, whatever. And we ask it for your praise, glory, and honor. Through Jesus Christ our Lord and God's people said,